Maybe not. Maybe not. Let me let me read this scripture real quick and then we'll get we'll get going. So in Philippians chapter two, it says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, I'm going to stop there. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Right. Does it make you want to shout? Right. When you think about the Lord. Oh, I'm a, yeah, you know where I'm going. Right. Does it make you get excited when you think about all that God has done in your life? Where he's taking you. Anybody remember what you were? <laughs> right, amen? Anybody remember those days, those moments, those times when you were down and out? And, and yet God was like, hey, hey, hey. No, 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 no. My people are never down and out. I'm just positioning them differently. I'm just getting them ready for a new season. My people are never down and out. They're, be, they're beginning to learn how to shout. They're beginning to learn how to praise. But he goes, if there's any encouragement... He says, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, uh, complete my joy be, by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord. I, I think we heard it. We're, we're in full accord right now. I like it. And, and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than of yourselves. Let each of you look not only onto his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So, Father God, God, I pray that that, that is us, So, oh God, that we would be people that find the encouragement in you, oh God, that we find the comfort, that we find the love, the sympathy, Father God, that we understand, oh God, that you, oh God, are the author and the finisher of all things, oh God, that you are God and that is still sovereign, that you are still enthroned in the heavenlies, oh God, that there is nothing on this earth Lord God, that will, will, will come against you to have a victory because you've already won the victory, Father God. Every battle, every war, everything that comes against you will bow before you, Father God, at the mighty name of Jesus. And this morning as we dive into the word of God, let us remember the encouragement that we found in you. And God, we give you praise and honor. We ask all this in your son, Jesus Christ, precious name. And the church said, Amen. We'll take your seat this morning. I want to share with you out of this passage this morning as we as we think about this instead of quote ante this this idea of the, that God is calling his church back to the original design. Amen. That's that's the whole concept. Instead of quote ante, it's it's a return to what was. Because sometimes we need to get back to what was. Sometimes we need to get back to that moment that that, that same spirit, that same mindset. What is it that God has called us to do? And over the years, what we've seen from the very beginning, Adam and Eve, they so often would go off of status quo, so often would go get off the, the, the path. Adam and Eve is such a great example of them in the garden doing what they do, right? Naming the animals, eating the, in the fruit. And then somebody comes along one day, a slick talker, and says, hey, have you thought about that tree? Have you thought about that? And they should have said, no, no, hey, status quo is we hang out with God. He comes out, and we, we hang out together, and we, you know, we eat the fruit, we're, we're good, we, we get to name all these animals, we take care of it, everything's cool. But they said, well, no, I want to I I move from that. And yet from that moment on, when they ate the fruit, I want you to understand something. God has continually said, let's go back to status quo. Let's go back to the original design where, guess what's going to happen? I'm just going to walk with you in the cool of the day. Then my presence is going to be with you. And, and, and those of you who know your Bible, you're now thinking Genesis Revelation is exactly that story. God's plan of reconciliation back to himself, back to status quo. Jesus shows up on this earth and he lives and, and for 30 years and he pours into disciples and teaches them how to walk and talk and think and begins to illustrate for them and say, this is what the church needs to be. And they institute the church. The disciples institute the church. Why? Because they want to make it to the point where we're back to the status quo of what God desired. Why do you think if you read in the book of Acts that they have so many saved all the time? Why do you think if you look at the book of Acts and it says things like they were all of one accord, that they were all together, that, that miracles, signs, and wonders, that nobody had need. Why? Because they had got back to status quo. The presence of God was in that place. Acts chapter 2 is not the only time the Holy Spirit descends. You see it multiple times, Acts chapter 3. 
multiple times. The Spirit descends, and then they go out, and they begin to... Why? Because they went back to the status quo. Do you understand where I'm talking about right now? Because that's what I believe God is trying to get His church back to today. It's saying, hey, my return is soon and very soon. And I need my church back to status quo. I need my church back to what was. Not what you think is going to work in this day, in this age, in this world. But what I designed from the beginning. Because guess what? What God designed worked. Amen? Right? You guys have read your Bible, right? I just want to make sure you guys agree with me. Because if not, this is the wrong place for you right now. Because what God designed worked. It's interesting to me as I read the Bible and I talk to others, and, and it, I talk about Frank all the time. I love my buddy Frank, 90 year old guy, right? And just he, the last several years, he just, man, he's just learning God and knowing who God is. And he calls me every week, talks, talks about God and what to do. And he's like, Pastor, every time I go in the, in the book, it, it tells me what, how to live my life, right? Every time I, I, I come under a situation, I go into the book and I, I ask God, God, would you show something to me? You know, would you show me something in this word that will help me in this situation? And can I tell you, he's not just a 90-year-old retired guy. His, his wife's a trustee in one of the most vile uh, uh, situations, government situations I've ever experienced before. I would go, I would go to these trustee meetings, these, these, these city meetings, and there was actually fist fights happening between the trustees. The mayor slapped the, the, the county clerk at one point. That's going on in these kind of meetings. Do, do you understand me? Right? And, and, and they're all Christians on, on all the trustees, the, the mayor, and, and uh, he was a deacon at one of the churches. And, and right, all these, all this situation going, going on in that. And I remember I had a, a meeting with the, with the mayor, and, and, and I said, hey, can we start these meetings with prayer? There's nothing legally wrong with that. He's a Christian. And you would think a Christian would say, deacon of a, of a church, say, that's a great idea. So you know what? There's really no place for prayer in this. So his wife is, is, is in the midst of this. The shining lights. And so he's going to his Bible all the time. God, how do I deal with this situation? How do I deal with the hatred and, the, and, and just the, the, the ugliness? And he goes, guess what, Pastor James? Every time I ask God, I open up. And right there in the pages, it tells me exactly what to do. So one more time, understand in the Bible is all the answers. God's original design still works. It's, it's never been perfected. Amen. It, it, it can't be morphed and said, okay, well, because we're in a current situation, we need to morph this. No, no, no. God's original design. And that's the design that God desires for us. And that's the design that Paul is talking to the church of Philippi about in, in this letter to the Philippians. And last week we, we looked at this idea of you know, God calling us back, God calling us to, to, to the moment to say, number one, we've got to die to ourselves. I must die. Right? He, he says, I, I don't live. It's no longer I that lives. He says, you know, to, to, to me, to live is Christ. In fact, this is what I want you to do, church of Philippi. I want you to look like Christ. In fact, when you walk around, I want them to say, hey, I met Jesus today. And, and somebody look at you and said, but, but well, no, you, you met Hezioni today. No, 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 no. No, I was talking to Hezioni, but I met Jesus. Do you, do you understand? That, that Paul was saying that it, it's so possible that you can look and think and talk and, and, and walk like Jesus and act like Jesus, that they recognize there's no way on this earth that she can act and talk and think and be that way. That there was such power that came through and in and amongst what was happening that they recognized it must have been some something heavenly. It must have been something that, that was beyond themselves, right? There, there, there must have been a power behind that. And when they begin to ask, well, what power? And do we do we know our Bible in the book of Acts? How many times? By what name? How are you able to do what you're able to do? And they would say, there's no other name but Jesus. Paul says, hey, I want you to be like that. So that when you walk out into a crowd and you begin to give them a word of knowledge, that you begin to look at that person and say, hey, yes, last night when you were reading the paper. And they look at you and how did you know? Well, I was talking to my God about you. I was talking about my father about you. That, that, that we walk in that kind of power. And that's what he said. Begin to looking at our lives in that concept. And today I want to 
Look again now in Philippians chapter 2 as we kind of turn the page a little bit and, and recognize Paul says, okay, not only do you need to die to yourselves and understand what God's purpose for your life is for you to be in the, the body of Christ out and amongst the people, out the, to be the light in the darkness. Because can I tell you, as it gets darker, we got to get lighter. Amen. we got to shine that thing. He says, this is what I want you to do. He says, first and foremost, understand, again, Paul is in prison. He's writing this letter from prison. And he says, so if, if there is any encouragement. Now understand, verse 1 of chapter 2 is a continuation of chapter 1. Amen. You guys all know that, right? The chapters were put in a long time ago, but after the, the letters were written. Originally, they would have been written as one or, or read as one. And he says this, so if there's any encouragement, all that other things I talked to you about, all those other things of dying, all those other things of, of dealing with situations, if there's any encouragement, he says, this is what I want you to do. He says, if there's any encouragement. I, I, I love that encouragement because it's not about the feelers. How many people got feelers in this place? I have one. I have one feeling. I always joke with people, I got one feeling. Obviously, we, we have more feelings, but it's, just, it's, just, it's not about making you feel good. But is there any encouragement? Is there any spiritual activity going on? Is, is there anything that's stirring you up? Right? Not physically in, the, in the, the concept of my emotions are good, but I begin to feel something beyond my emotions. You see, that's what, what Christianity should be about. That I feel bad, but I got a joy that's unceasing. I, I feel bad, but I can walk into a room and I can light the room up. Because it's not based on my feelings. He says, if there's any encouragement, when you think about what's going on in your day, when you, when you think about what's going on in your life, have you seen any spiritual encouragement in your life? Can I just tell you, far too many of us in, in the world definitely we are, we are based on our emotions. Our, our emotional being takes over. I don't like the situation. I'm not comfortable. But those are the words, I, I, I. And what Paul says, if there's any encouragement in the spiritual activity that's going on, right? as, you, as you see signs and wonders, as you see salvations, as you hear about miracles, as you, as you hear about things happening, do you have any encouragement? And can I tell you, if we would just get that as a church, as in a body, we would go say, is there any encouragement? Have I seen God move at all? Have, can I ask you, have you seen God move? Man, over and over. Last week I shared three testimonies alone that happened that week. Who, who knows what else has happened in the lives of so many of us? And, and to remember and to look at what God has done and to understand that my shout of hallelujah I could be like Paul in prison and shout hallelujah as, as well as I can at the mountaintop. Why? Because it doesn't matter whatever situation I'm in, God is still good. It doesn't matter in whatever situation I'm in, God can still move and will move and is moving. Paul understood that and begins to tell this church of Philippi, hey, I'm in prison, but don't worry about it, man. I got encouragement. I'm good. I'm, I'm good in this space. If I die here, cool. If I live, cool. If I come to you, cool. He goes, I, I don't care. I've, I've got, well, I'm, a, I'm preaching that one later on, but he goes, at the end, I, I become content. I, I'm able to do all things because he goes, I understand. I've got encouragement. I've got a joy that's unceasing. And he goes, he goes on. Is there any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and, and sympathy? He says, have you experienced God in any of those ways? And I'm just wondering how many of you have ever experienced the love of God? I mean, really, you've experienced the love of God, that, that, that what I call the warm hug of, hug of God, right? There's those moments, and, and can I tell you, I just remember those moments so often, and I'll come, come back. Man, I was just talking about, God, I just, I just can't imagine how He can love me as much as He does, because I know who I am. And yet in those moments when I feel useless, unlovable, and I begin to worship Him, I begin to give Him praise, all of a sudden I, I, I get a warm feeling. And, and I, I just, I always equate that warm feeling to a hug. 
my daddy's giving me a hug, telling me, hey, it's going to be all right, slugger. It's going to be okay. You're going you're to make it through that. Hey, if we, have you, if you received any of that? He says, if you've received any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, have you seen God move? That's what he's asking. Have you seen God move? Have you seen miracles? Whether they, they've been miracles you've received or miracles you've seen. Amen? That you've experienced, that you've heard about. He says, if any of those, right, you've, you've got the love, you've got the participation in the Spirit and affection and sympathy that, that you feel from the warmth of the body, and this is where we start to transition a little bit. And he says, okay, all this stuff is about God, but now I want you to understand. He says, I created the body as an extension of myself. And he says, and as a body, what we should understand that when I walk into the body, when I walk into the church, I should feel affection and give affection. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You don't ever want that one, do you, right? God, give me, you know, make sure people, if people don't, don't, don't love on me, I'm going to be mad. But you see Paul saying, hey, be ready to receive and to give. And actually, you give and then receive, just FYI. So if you're waiting for affection, you better go hug somebody. He says, have you received any of that? If you've experienced any of that, he says, this is what I want you to do then. Complete my joy. He says, complete my joy. I love Paul because in this, I, I see Paul as that pastor, as that shepherd that loves the church, right? And it just, just poured into this church, so encouraged, encouraged by this church. He says, my, my joy is almost complete. I'm like right there. He said, if you would just push a little farther, if you just go a little bit more, he says, just be in the same mind. Complete my joy. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever experienced that before where, 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 where you know, man, you just, it's, it's like a good Christmas. Y- y'all know a good Christmas. And you're like, you know what, top this Christmas off. I, it's, it's like, I think about my daughter, Jordan. It's like, you know what, make this Christmas great for my daughter this year. It was a great Christmas, but you know what would be just incredible would be to have her. That, do you know what I'm saying? That's what Paul is saying at that point. He says, Man, it's good. If, if, if you guys don't do anything more, I'm going to still love you, and, and I'm going to brag about you guys all the time. But he said, you know what would be really good? It's to be in the same line. You understand, and, and I love Paul, and, and I want you to know I'm preaching to you today as this church because I love you beyond anything you can imagine. Some of you have have been with me in those those kind of those meetings, and I talk about the love for this church, and that you see me start being what we call stupid crying, right? Because I love this church. I, I absolutely, yes, Lori, I, mean, I do. I think about this church all the time. I, I just can't imagine ever being in any other place. All the other churches I've been a part of, right? I've never had this experience before. 16 years in Chicago, multiple churches, I never felt like home. And I'm home now. I hope you understand what that means. So as Paul, as Paul preaching, that's kind of what he's saying. He goes, I, that, that's my home. He goes, I planted all these other churches, but that's my home. That's how I feel about you. So when I read Phil, uh, Philippians here, I'm thinking the same thing. And I'm like, man, we are so close. So I, 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 I'm, I'm about to transition because I'm about to ask you to be of one mind. To be of one mind. Right? We, we're so close. Make my joy complete. Let's be of one mind. Let's, let's push forward. He says, I, what I want you to do is I want you to be of full accord. I want you to be together. And he goes on, and, and I love what he says here. This is one of those, those English, you know, English teachers, they're mean. Well, any English teacher in the place? Let me, oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to apologize. They're not mean. At least mine were. I had nightmares about English. Let me just tell you. And they make you diagram a sentence. Anybody remember that garbage? Or, or I'm sorry, that is good stuff. That's the right thing. Man, I'm in trouble now. All the parents in the house. Pastor, don't say that. Adverbs and verbs and nouns and pronouns and unnouns and quadrilogical. I don't know. I, I, I don't like English. And English doesn't like me. This is one of those English problems. Right? When you look at it and you're like, how do I diagram this? Well, he, he starts out and he says, these, he's got these four things. He says, if there's an encouragement, and this is what it means. And then he says, if, if, if you're going to complete my joy, he says, be in the same mind. He goes, okay, be in the same mind means this. He says, number one, have the same love. Have the same love. 
He says, that love that you've received from Christ, that love that you have for Christ, love the body is the same. In fact, why don't you do this? Turn to somebody that you're not related to and tell them you love them. I dare you. I... Amber, I love you. Uh, you. You looked all alone there for a second. Anybody else not get an I love you? Hey, Lucas, you're on the camera. I love you, buddy. He, 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 says, he says, I want you to have that same, you know, that, that, that feeling that you get, that warm feeling that you get from God. He says, that warm feeling when you get a hug. He says, if you guys could just replicate that in church. If you get to that point, right? He says, where, where, where you look in, see, this is what he's saying. Do you know that God is chasing you? I, I, you need to know that. God is chasing you down. Cameraman, are you ready? You better be ready. I'm about to run. Okay. He's chasing you down, and he's coming over here, and he wants to hug you. Love you, man. Right? He, th that's God. Wes is not looking at me. He doesn't want to hug. I saw him turn. He's like, don't, don't, don't hug me. Don't look at me. Right? That's God. Now, Paul says, now do the same. So next week when I come into church, I should see people running from one end to the other hugging people. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Just don't hug me. I'm not a big hugger. Give me a high five. Right? But do you see? Do you see that's what he's saying? He says, he says understand that God is, is so loving. He's chasing you, this, this everlasting love. He says, now if you could just get that to the body. And understand, he loves this church. He goes, you guys are so cool. You're, you're just doing great things. He says, now just push it a little bit farther. Be a little bit more like Christ. And to get to the point, and church, Life Church at Easton, push a little harder. Learn to love a little bit better. Learn to love a little, uh, go out of your ways. Yeah, if you're uncomfortable giving a hug, I'm sorry, Cameron, I know that was uncomfortable, right? If you're right, just do it. Just do it. We need to learn. He says, he says, uh-oh, uh-oh. He says, give me a hug, baby. <laughs> Nobody else. You all start standing up. I'm running quick. No. Right, but it's that, it's that inspiration to know, man, that person needs a hug. Body, do we understand what he's saying in this moment? You want the fullness of God? You want the fullness of that? There's no play, better place to be than to come in here and to get a hug from somebody, to get a love from somebody. How are you? Man, I love you. It's good to see you. That's why I talk about all the time, when you guys are gone, it hurts because we're thinking about you. Amen? We're thinking about, are they okay? Are they, it's, it's, it's not we're not taking roll call and going, oh, man, you know, they, they've missed two Sundays in a row. You're, you're bad. No, we want to make sure you're okay. Because it's easy to get lost in this world. It's easy to, to get to the point, point where we, we isolate ourselves because that's what the enemy wants us to do. He, we isolate ourselves, right? And then we sit back and we wonder, does anybody think about me? And can I just tell you, we are all busy. I understand that. But if you think of somebody during the week, call them, reach out to them. If you don't have their number, call the office. We will get your number, and we're working on a directory, by the way. So I'm, we're, hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll, we'll talk about this because it's necessary. Don't wait for the pastor to call them. You call them. Amen? Amen? We need to be that. And Paul says, just be those kind of people. that, that you, Somebody bring, you, you just think about somebody, all of a sudden there's a reason. The Holy Spirit is bringing them to your remembrance. And you need to reach out and say, hey, I love you. Hey, I miss you. How you doing? Are you doing okay? And it wouldn't hurt you to go to lunch with somebody every once in a while. I'm just going to say that. You don't have to pay for lunch, by the way. Amen? You can say, hey, do you want you, you want to go for lunch? You're buying. No, don't say that. You want to go for lunch? Right? Let's, let's go. Hey, where are you going to lunch? Can I tag along? I'll pay for myself. Whatever it takes. To say, let's move. And, and, and Paul says, if you could just do that, you complete my joy. He says, be the same love. And then he says, be in full accord. I love that. The Greek is talking about the unity of the soul. 
the mind, the will, the emotion, the unity of the soul, right? This, this understanding that, that we're all kind of focused on the same thing. And can I tell you, again, I love this church. And one of the most incredible things, and if you've not experienced it before, well, kind of shame on you, but let me just explain. Sunday school is run by Ross. Dr. Mike fills in every once in a while, right? On, on, on Wednesday nights, obviously, it's me a lot of times, but some others will have others going through Thursday nights. We've got women's Bible study with Lori. It's comical how in sync we are. He doesn't check with me. She doesn't check with me and say, hey, I, we want to go this direction. And I don't know how many times I've heard my wife say, wow, wow, they just, they, they're just they they're saying that you've got them a uh, uh, video camera, right? That you're listening to everything they say. I'm like, yeah, but I said it on Sunday or vice versa. They'll say something on Thursday. I'll say it Sunday. In fact, was it last, last Sunday at, at Sunday school, right? You guys talk about, I had no idea. I'm up here trying to, to ruin the worship team by, by leading. And, and they're back there. So I, there's no way I could pay attention to what was happening. And then, you know, I'm talking and I saw people looking. At, yeah, that's what we talked about. What is that called? Huh, being full accord. Right? That, that we're hearing the same spirit. Our, our, our mindsets are, are, are there. That doesn't just happen. It, I've never experienced it, and I've been part of some great churches in the past. I've never seen that. Normally, it's like they're they're kind of going their way, and they're going this way, and and it's not it's bad, but it's not quite in sync to where like you're hearing the same message over and over and over. It's one of those things like the political commercials. You just want to shut it off because it's just agnosium. You hear it over and over and over again. Well, that's kind of what we're hearing. So if you're Sunday school and then you're Wednesday night and you're blessed to be a, a, a woman Thursday night, you're, you're going to probably hear the same message three times, right? And you are be like, uh, well, maybe God's trying to say something. Yes, by the way, FYI, that he is, right? To be in full accord, understand that's what he's called us to do, amen? To be in full accord, to hear and to be thinking through that. He says, understand it. That should be your goal. Every ministry should be in the same uh, wavelength, right? It should be thinking through the same thing. Why? Because we need to be in full accord. Why do Pastor Jen and I, why do we ensure that she's teaching what I'm teaching here on Sunday mornings? FYI, if you don't know that, your kids are hearing the same message, right? Just her style, which is way better for those kids because they're scary, right? So she can handle them, right? Why do we do that? Because I want to be in full accord. I want your homes to be in full accord. I want you to go home and be able to talk about, well, what did you learn about? Oh, unity. Okay, cool. Let's talk about it. Why? Because it's important. Paul says it's so important for a church to be in accord. Because let me tell you, your thoughts and your attitudes are the basis of your speech and your actions. Do I, do I need to say that again? It says that your, 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 your thoughts and your attitudes are the basis of your speech and your actions. So what we're thinking about, what we're processing, what we're learning will then become our actions and they'll become our speech. We'll begin to talk and think and act differently. And have you not seen that over the last couple of years as we begin to see the homeless ministry and other ministries that are, that are happening, things that are going on? But what's happening? It's not Pastor James is doing a great job. The church is coming together in full accord and we're, we're beginning to think on the same things. And when we start thinking on the same things, it, inevitably we've got to go act on it. Or rather we get or rather we could get spit out by Jesus, right? He, he said, because you're lukewarm. He, we're, we're talking and thinking and act, right? So then all of a sudden our speech begins to change, our actions begin to change. And and we do the next thing, which he, he says, now be of one mind. And understand, he's not saying one mind again, like he said, you know, be of the same mind. He's now saying be of the same purpose. Be of the same purpose. He says, before, you know, I want you guys to think alike. I want you to be a full accord. I want you to have the same soul about things, the mind, your will, your emotions. And, and then he says, now, once you've done it, once you have the love of Christ, amen, once you have that love, he says, and, and now that you've got the same thought process, now I want you to have the same purpose. Some would call it a vision. I, I remember one, one day uh, at one of my churches, uh, uh, a lady came up, and, and she was actually a, a, an elder 
And she said, Pastor, I just need to know what the vision for the church is. And, and I found it very odd because I'm like, I've been talking about it forever. I've been, I've been saying the same thing forever. And she said, we just, you just got to make it plain, you know, write it down so they can run with it. You guys know the scripture. I, I said, okay, okay. So the next Sunday I made it plain. So you're ready. I'm going to make it plain for you. What's, what's my vision for Life Church at Easton? Grow and go. Does it have to be? Yeah. Does it have to be any more plain than that? What, my vision for this church, which I believe is the same as what Paul would say, is I want to invest as much in you as I can. Because we have not arrived yet. Okay, only a couple of you. Everyone else. We have not arrived yet. And I mean we mean me. We have not arrived yet from glory to glory. It says that we, we, we learn and we grow in Him and we become more like Him. And, and, and that should be our thing. So, so my vision when I think about what, where God has called us is to grow. Amen? Why we teach what we're teaching on Wednesday nights. Why is it we're, we're doing what we're doing? Right? So that we grow, that we become a, a more unified body. But then as we grow, then we're equipping you to go. And give life, give great life. Let me say it that way. I, I love that tagline because what, what that is what God has called us to. Okay, so so understand. You're like, well, Pastor James, what's your vision? My vision is to give you so much word that it gets so deep into you. You know your word so much that it explodes out of you. That you would say it's like a fire shut up in my bones. That that you hear me over and over, and every other leader over and over. Again, just saying to, to learn, to grow deeper, to go deeper, but then to push you as hard as I possibly can, not down, but out. To say, now go and do. My hope, my goal, my dream is to see that before wall emptied only, only because that is full and we're trying to find other names to put on there. My, my hope, my prayer is that this thing gets so full, Marvin has a full-time job making more of them that we've got to fill it up. My, my plan, my hope is, is that I hear about every single one of your, your children, your grandchildren coming to know Jesus Christ one more time. That is my goal. That's my vision. And as a church, that must be our purpose. That our homes become places of worship. Our homes become places where God is enthroned. Amen. And that the people that walk into that, that home are slain by the Spirit of God in that moment, in that time. Why? Because the presence is there. But understand, as we grow in Him, we must therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what's the purpose? Go and go give life. I mean, they, they, that, that's it. And Paul says, I just want you all to have the same purpose. He says, get, get in there. Get, figure out what, what your purpose is. What, figure out what your plan is. He explains it to him, by the way, later on. He says, understand, this is what you're called to do. Let me just tell you, it's not about growing the church. It really isn't. I've said this multiple times in other churches, I have the perfect church size in mind, and it's not a mega church. Do you understand me? And if we if we fill this box and we move all those and they all go to different churches, well, praise God. As long as they go to church. Our outreach is not about getting people in our church. If it was, we wouldn't do it down in Van Buren Station. We wouldn't do it in Reynoldsburg this next Saturday. We, we would try to find local places. We'd hand out, if you've been with me at prayer, we don't hand out pamphlets very often. I forget them. Why? Because it's not about that. It's about telling somebody Jesus loves you beyond all of imagination. And if God desires to grow the church, he's going to grow the church. In fact, it says that Jesus will grow the church. If we try to do anything to grow the church, then it's not going to work. D do you hear me? Right? Praise God as he adds numbers and he has been adding numbers. But understand, that is not our purpose. Amen? Because if it was, we'd change some things. We ain't going to change some things. We're going to praise God as loud as we can praise God. We're going we're gonna, to you know, we're, we're do what he's called us to do. But Paul, as he's writing to him, says, man, if you can have the same heart, if you could love each other, if you could just learn that, to love people, to, to, to give them that, that hug, if you could just do that, 
and, and be of the same accord, reading and thinking and processing the same things. And then he says, and then just have the same purpose. Understand where you're going. I love this uh, uh, a theologian from 1900 says this, the most persuasive of all exhortations to unity. He's talking about this passage in, in Philippians. And he says, and the most omnipotent of all powers to enforce it. Okay, what did he say there? He says there, Paul is saying to them, you must have unity, but God has given you the power to have unity. And it's something I've talked about before. It's so incredible as you see this Philippians church, as you see the other churches, they become this amalgamation of different races, amalgamation of different cultures, amalgamation of different uh, uh, political stances, different uh, uh, economic stances. Their social culture is different. And he says, we're going to bring all these people together, and I want you to have unity. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work in the world. You can't bring an Ohio State fan and a Michigan fan into the same room and not have some problems. Amen. You, you with me? But you know what? We could have a, a whole bunch of Michigan fans, a whole bunch of Ohio State fans that still praise Jesus in this place and have full accord, have full unity. Amen? That should be what the church should be. Amen? That if somebody walks in and he's wearing, the, he's sporting the, the M, the Michigan M, that you give them the biggest hug and you mean it. Not just to squeeze their life out of them, but to actually love on them and say, I love you with all that I'm... Do you, do you understand? That's what he's saying. Paul says, hey, you're about to go into a situation. You, you, you're dealing with things. You're going to deal with struggles you've never dealt with before. You're going to see people that you don't understand. Their cultural background, you don't understand. Economic background, they're going to have different thought process. And yet, you, he goes, I want you to love them with everything you've got. And then I want you to be in the same accord, the same mindset, thinking about the same Jesus. And now I want you to go out with them. And I want you to go to their, their area and tell people about Jesus. Paul, Paul says it, this is the theologian later on says, and, and he gave us all the power to do it. Church, do, do you understand what he's saying to us? See, it doesn't matter what divides us. It matters what unites us. That if we could get focused on Jesus Christ and giving Him the praise, raising Him up, and showing the world who Jesus is, all the things that separate us go away. Because they no longer matter. Because all that other garbage is just that. It's garbage. At the end of the day, it dies. It withers away. It fades. It's not eternal. It's, as I read this, and I... I, I realize something that true humility takes us being humble. Man, that's hard. But also bold. It's this dichotomy of saying, I, I, I've got to be humble, humble enough to say, you know what, maybe I don't know best. Maybe there are different ways. Maybe, maybe I am not the best. Maybe I'm not right. Guess what? Maybe they're not right. But that's okay. Let's push forward. Right? We, we, we can't agree on this. We, can, we can't agree on, on our, our teams. We can't agree on our politics. We can't agree on, on, on you know, our music styles. We can't agree. But I'm going to back away from this, and then I'm going to push boldly into that relationship. Do you hear me this morning? It's Paul is writing to this church, saying, if you guys want to really be the church that you need to be, he says, you need to take all your attitudes, all your wants, your likes, your dislikes, throw them all away. Find a church, find a body, or in this case, be a body in the church of Philippi. He says that loves unconditionally, that thinks about Jesus, and then goes tell people about Jesus. He said, all that other stuff, just, just throw it away. It doesn't matter. Well, well, I, you know, I, I don't like this style. I don't like that style. I don't throw it all away. Do you agree with the vision? Are you, are you ready, willing, and able to grow? I'm asking you. 
And then are you ready, willing, and able, or, or maybe at least sort of willing to go and to give life? See, Paul is writing to him and saying, if you guys are good with those two things, if, if you guys are good with that, he says, you've completed my joy, now go and do it. I'm asking you the same thing. Are you, are you willing to invest yourself enough to say, yes, I want to grow? It's so many. I mean, our Wednesday nights have doubled in size. I mean, we're, we're I, I don't know what we're going to do with space. We're going to figure something out, right? So I know you guys are there. Right? You're saying, I'm ready. I'm re ready. Man, I understand there's stuff I can learn. There's something I can grow. There's something I can, I can invest more. He said, he said, so when we begin to say that, then we say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to invest myself to grow, but I'm not going to just sit here and grow. Now I'm going to go, and whether that's into my home or into other places, into different ministries that we're going, going into, uh, different opportunities, invest myself. He says, he, he's telling them, if you guys just do all that, you're going to be gravy, right? You're going to be awesome. You're going to really do it. So I'm asking the church the same thing. Are we willing to do that? We're we really willing to invest ourselves. Lastly, I want to share this quote. This is probably there is no single thing so much insisted on in the New Testament as the importance of harmony among Christians. This is written in the 1830s by a theologian, Albert Barnes. He's, but he says this, Now there is almost nothing so little known, but if it prevailed, the world would soon be converted to God. John, John says it. Jesus talks and he says, They'll know you by your love. But then John chapter 17, Jesus prays this prayer. He says, Let them be one as we are one. I and you, you and me, and them and I. And he told them this, if you guys could love like I love, if you could have the unity, he said, the world, I love how he said it, the world would be converted to Jesus. One mission, one thought, one purpose, one plan. And so many of us, our world right now, I know there's so many of you are dealing with lost loved ones. Let me just tell you, a unified body Nothing can stand against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against a church that's unified. Amen. And it, as we think about all that God has done in, in, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate our, 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 our mortgage burning because, again, we paid our mortgage off 12 years early. God is so good. But all the things that God has done, the, the salvations, the the, just the economic blessing that he's brought into the church, the ability to pay bills and to, and to be debt free, to owe no man nothing. All, the, all these things are their one reason is because we're beginning to unify deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I'm asking you now, can we go deeper? I want to be that church. I want to be that Acts church. I, 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 I want to I see the Spirit descend like tongues of fire. And then we all go out into the world and we begin to tell them about Jesus. I, I, I want to see those moments where here we're worshiping and, and you get inspired so much to go to your home and begin to speak words of knowledge and wisdom into your kids' lives and tell them things they didn't think you knew. And you can tell them, hey, I've been talking to God about you and He told me these things about you. You see, that's what happens when a body completely unifies, be completely begins to dial in. So this morning we're going to receive communion. A couple of weeks ago we talked about communion. Again, it's not just a remembrance of Christ. It's an incredible moment. It's what we should do. Thanking Him for the, the, the body. Thanking Him for the blood. But it's a covenant relationship. It's a co I'll say it. It's a covenant relationship. And so when you take it, what you're doing is one more time signing at the bottom line, saying, you are my God. I accept salvation, but now I'm going to do and to walk and to think and to act like you. Paul would write and he'd say, some of you are sick because you're taking it unworthy, right? Because you're, you're taking it just, just because to take it. You're hungry. You're just doing it because other people are looking at you. He says, but you're not checking yourselves. So we always have to check ourselves first. Amen. And, and guess what? That checkup can take 30 seconds. And you can reconcile with God in 30 seconds. Amen? Right?
But he says, understand that. But then again, as you receive communion, you're one more time covenanting. And when, in the early church, uh, the church of uh, 150 AD and on for, for, for hundreds of years, they would, they would have communion and they would base it on what the word they just heard. And said, God, we're renewing our covenant. Now that I know, I will go. Now that I know, I will do. I've not just, as James would say, would say what, heard the word and then kind of forgot about it, like looking in the mirror. He said, I'm going to be a, a hearer of the word and a doer. And so as we receive communion this morning, that's my heart, and that's how I'm going to receive it. God, I've heard your word this morning. Your word told me I need to love people greater than I love them right now in a way that you love them. God, you told me to be in full accord, to be thinking, to have my soul in the same mindset. But also, God, you told me that to be at a church that has the same purpose and to dive into that purpose. So as I receive communion this morning, that's I'm covenanting it with you as well. To say, God, you are my God. I praise you for this. Thank you. I praise you for what you've done, oh God. And I covenant with you. And you told me to be part of a body. I'm now part of a body. And God, I covenant with this body. Can we do that this morning? I covenant with this body to grow. I want to grow, Father God. I want to be more like you. And not only do I want to grow, but then I also want to go and give life. I, I, I want to go into the highways and the byways. I want to go into my home. I want to go into my workplace. I want to go everywhere I can to bring you praise. So would you stand this morning as, as we get ready to receive communion? And the first and the very first thing we should always do is take a moment and ask like David would say, God, test me, know me, see if there be any wicked way in me. If I have unforgiveness, if, if I'm holding anything in that would be unworthy of you, God, reveal it to me right now. And as you reveal it to me, God, forgive me. Because I want to, I want to receive. So would you do that? Just next 30 seconds. Father, I thank you that you are so good. Father God, that you, that you are willing to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. God, that you don't hold things against us, but Father God, when we turn and we repent, that you do heal us. Father God, you heal us from that sickness. You heal us from that, 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 that evil, that, that, the, the, the shortcomings that we've had, and allow us to come back into a relationship with you. So, Father God, if there be anything in us, oh God, that would be unworthy of this, we repent of it right now. God, asking you not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us, oh God. Before we take, if you're, if you're at home this morning, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go, go to your fridge. Well, shut this off first. You can go to your fridge or wherever. Get a cracker, get something. Go ahead and gather your family around the room and, and receive communion in that mindset. So this morning, let's pray. Hey, Pastor James here. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that during worship and the message, you were able to engage with the loving God. We here at LCA are so passionate about God and interacting with them that we are called to go give life, to love everyone, to interact with God, to focus on the will of the Father, and to experience a real encounter with God. As you work, worship today and, and heard the word, I pray that you were able to take something from those moments and put it into your life so that you can begin to walk as a disciple of Christ. We would love to come alongside you on your journey. Maybe you haven't even started your journey and you want to know how. Just let us know you're out there. We'd love to, to talk with you and engage with you. Let us know you're watching. And if you have any questions or any way we can help you become the disciple that God has called you to be, let us know. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you soon.